Association for Living in Water. Um, also, in terms of animals, it's dominated by beavers. We have a lot of beavers out there. Does anyone live close enough to the swamp to actually like see the beavers? You, yeah. I've definitely, I've, over the years uh, at the university, I've gotten several calls about the beavers, about um, how they are doing damage to people's backyards in this area. They are definitely the architects of you know, some of the water movement in this area. Um, I think the really important thing to note about this is that it's actually a spring-fed swamp. So it is not fed by rainwater coming in from the top. There are dozens of springs that are in the in the, um, the swamp. If you've ever gone there and looked over the boardwalk, you've maybe seen bubbles coming up and you thought like maybe there's something living under there. It's actually probably the, the springs feeding it with water. And the water table itself is above the surface. So this, the, this is the water table itself. So this is a place where the springs pop out to the aquifer that is normally underground. The water pops out of those springs and then becomes the surface of the water there. Um, and then it feeds into the creek from there. So basically it's like daylighting in the swamp, uh, the water is. Um, so that's really important to note when we talk about the development that comes later. Um, wetlands in general, not just swamps, but wetlands in general have enormous benefits to the local community. Um, the biggest one I think most people are familiar with is flood and erosion control. So when we have a big rain event, the swamp will hold water longer. It acts like a sponge and it will absorb an enormous amount of extra water and hold it for longer so that it can, for some of it will percolate back into the water table. It will slow it so it doesn't rush down the creek all at once. Um, so that's a really important uh, feature that it provides. And of course it prevents erosion because it'll, that if you can slow the water down, you'll also slow down um, the dirt going with it. Um, the plants and the soil that are in the swamp are also adapted to purify. They can actually, some of the plants are specifically adapted to, you know, um, absorb toxins and things like that. So it can actually clean the water. And then of course the physical act of going through the soil also cleans the water. So the, the thing about the water purification is that it's hard to see and it's sometimes not appreciated by the local community, but if you try to reproduce that effect mechanically, it would cost a ton of money. So it gives us all these um, important services for free. It's also a nursery for baby animals. So it's not just baby fish. So people who are you know, interested in fishing bigger fish, the, the little ones start out here. And then also it's all a nursery for a lot of insect species. So you'll find their, their larva throughout the water. And those are an important source of food for the fish. Um, it's critical habitat for a lot of animals. It's a real shame we don't have more endangered species there, but we basically have a lot of, there's a lot of species that depend on it, whether or not they're endangered. Um, something like, I wanna, I, this, is, this is like an approximation, but I think there's about 5% of our land in the US is wetlands, but over 30% of our species live in wetlands. So in general, they are biodiversity hotspots. Um, so, so many animals are adapted to use them. And it's also a very important migratory stopover for birds. So if anyone here is a birder, where the swamp is on the Alabama birding trail, it's got an enormous amount of birds that come visit. And so in the migratory months when there may not be a lot of other places to stop, this is a really important resting place for them. Um, and then of course, cultural value. It's a beautiful place. It is calming, it is lovely. There are also, of course, a lot of um, medicinal plants there, indigenous value to the space. Yes, I'm busy, I'm busy right now, okay? Good, all right. So, next slide, Arthur, thank you. We do have a couple of federally listed endangered species. The problem with endangered plants is that they are not actually protected on private land, they're only protected on federal lands, and so, this doesn't really do a lot of good for us in terms of protecting it against development. But we do have the Tennessee yellow-eyed grass and the eared cone flower are both present in the swamp and they are listed as endangered. Uh, we also have three animals that are currently under review. Um, I just looked on the um, US Fish and Wildlife webpage to see what the status was and I had not, re I, I knew these were listed. I didn't realize they'd actually been nominated in 2010, so it's been a minute. And uh, so I don't know if they're ever gonna get to the top of the line. U.S. Fish and Wildlife has recently surveyed for the Princess Alenia snail, but um, it's sort of to be determined if it can get fast-tracked. Um, but yeah, we have a species of dragonfly, two species of snail that are under review. Um, 
Probably, have some of you heard Alabama is number one in freshwater biodiversity. That's one of our big claims to fame. Um, a lot of that is in snails, mussels. A lot of it is these kind of little, little bottom dweller critters like this, where it'd be really hard for the uh, uh, regular person to tell the difference between these, but because of the way that they don't tend to move around a lot, they're not migrating like birds, they will, you know, only once, like this, like the Princess Alemia snail is only found in this section of the watershed and nowhere else in the world. Um, we also have a lot of other plants and animals. I would never be able to give you a list of every single plant and every single animal that lives there because there's hundreds of species, but I basically found some nice photos that Mike Harding took on the Facebook page and kind of threw some together to give you a sense of what you could see. Obviously poison ivy is not the crown jewel of the swamp, but I put it up there because there's a ton of poison ivy out there, so if you do go out, just keep an eye out. Um, but we also have, this is a cardinal flower, there are six species of orchids that are found in the swamp, and that's one of them. Um, we also have, uh, the golden clubs are a fun one that you can see from the boardwalk, so that's a nice one to keep an eye out for. You can see it like as these, like, it looks like actual golden clubs that are coming out from it, and it's kind of a cool water plant. Water plant. Um, we have red maples out there. We have a few other species you might be familiar with, tree species. There's loblolly pines out there. There's um, sweet gums. There's, let's see, there's tulip poplars. There's a few other trees interspersed with the, um, with the tubulo gums, which are the primary species. Uh, and then this hooded blue violet is also something you'll be able to see from the boardwalk. It's a really pretty, just a pretty flower. All right. Um, there's also a lot of animals there. As I mentioned, the birding is phenomenal. Tons of birds out there. Two that you would, if you're not a birder, these are obviously two that you could spot pretty easily. Um, we have a lot of great blue herons. I've also seen egrets out there pretty regularly, which are, you know, they look kind of like white herons. Um, Canada geese come by pretty regularly. Um, we also have, in addition to the beavers, we have river otters that have been seen there. We also have muskrats, kind of those fun, fun uh, mammals. And then of course, lots of cotton mouths, so just watch out. The boardwalk, of course, is a pretty safe place to walk, but I hear lots of sightings of cotton mouths there. Um, all right, history of the preserve. Um, it was donated to the UM Foundation in 1998 by the, the Bolton Orr family, um, which I know Clay is was friends with them, other people were friends with them too. Um, and before that, it was, it was privately owned land. People could walk around if they knew the family. Uh, it, the, the board, not the boardwalk, the preserve itself is about 60 acres. It's about six miles from campus, which for me as someone who takes students there, that poses a little bit of a challenge getting students there. I, I would love to use it more, but it's just, it's, it's kind of a, a whole hassle to move them out there. But I do it every semester. I bring um, at least one of my classes out here. Um, the house that the family lived in was purchased by the foundation. I actually don't know what year, maybe one of y'all knows, but like, they, the foundation purchased the house after the preserve was established. Um, and the house is currently being occupied by the environmental education program director who's serving as a caretaker for the swamp. Um, it's of course open for public use. It's open from dawn till dusk every day. It's also used for education. We have tons of programs. I'll talk a little bit more in a second about the environmental ed program that we run out of here. Um, but of course, lots of members of the public come. We also have a lot of folks come for education programs who are not affiliated with us. They're just using the space. And, um, and so yeah, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty high traffic area. The things you can find there if you go, the boardwalk is about 650 feet. So it's not, it, it's not actually very good for hiking. It's, it's much better for sitting and contemplating and like observing. It's not actually a good hiking spot at all. It's not enough space. Uh, we have an outdoor classroom you can see in this photo. There's the kind of benches back there, and then there's some artwork on the walls that were done by, um, if you're familiar with Colin Williams' um, community art class that has been responsible for a lot of the murals in town, um, like the Nurture Nature one and the fish one that I think recently came down, and then um, there's one at the, at the at Orr Park. Um, so that, uh, that's kind of fun. And then the animal sculptures, there's three of these. I also think one of them came down in a storm and I'm not sure what its status is, but there were three of these um, metal, they were recycled metal sculptures that were created and, and installed by Ted Metz's um, sculpture class, I think in 2010. And so those have been there for a while. 
Um, those are really cool because they're they're made they're made from metal and they are slowly decomposing into the environment and that's kind of the point of them is that they're they're sort of rusting apart but I think one of them actually did fall apart recently so to figure out what to do with that um, there's restrooms of course on site those are supposed to be unlocked every day but also we also know this door is supposed to be open too so I don't know if it is every day um, and then someday our long-term hope the real reason that the um, that the house was purchased is the hope that someday we can turn that into an interpretive center. It would be open to the public. We'd be able to host more groups and have more formal education program offerings and things. So if you know anybody who wants an interpretive center named after them, that's naming rights are on the table. Uh, we, we don't have a big donor yet, but that would be really helpful if we did. Um, so I also want to highlight the UM Environmental Education Program. We started this in 2019. Um, before that, Mike Hardig tried really hard to accommodate groups best he could, but he really could only bring one classroom of kids at a time. Really just about 25 people could come with him by himself. And so we would get periodically these requests for big field trip groups. You know, we've got the whole second grade coming out. Can we bring 120 kids? And so in 2019, we put the energy into um, doing a, I guess I could say a proof of concept. So, um, so I hired a bunch of students and trained them and we hosted a group. And then that gave, um, that gave the university confidence that we could run a program. So then we hired a full-time director, Jekka Thomason, that's right her right there. And, um, and so she's the one who lives at the swamp in the house. And then she also is responsible for hosting um, groups, we do a lot of K-12 field trip groups, homeschool groups, we do scout groups. We also do public, like, uh, like professional groups that just would like to do a fun field trip, um, team building kind of stuff. Um, so we do that. We also continue to employ students as our workers. So it's a great opportunity for the Montevallo students to um, interface with the public, public speaking skills, natural history skills, and um, and we also get students from all over campus, so it's not just environmental studies. There's lots of students who are interested in working with the public or working with children or working outside, so they all come work for us. It's also hopefully a long game recruitment strategy for the university. Part of why I think they wanted to invest in this education program is because, you know, when a kid was a junior in high school and they're thinking about where they want to go to school, if they have kind of a fond memory of going to Montevallo when they were in fifth grade, that might just you know, nudge them in that direction, right? There's not, I, I don't know if we'll ever be able to collect data on that, but the, ho the hope is that we can get young students here and get them interested in what great natural spaces we have in this area. So, next slide. Um, but of course, it has not all been happy and fun and games. Um, as I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know, we're currently facing a sort of existential threat to the swamps. Um, viability, uh, which is sort of related to um, the previous threat that happened in 2005 and 6. There was a quarry, develop a, a quarry developer proposed putting a quarry north of the swamp in the swamp source water area, and the university foundation actually filed suit against the quarry developer and was able to definitively prove that this quarry would drain, literally drain our swamp. Um, as I mentioned before, with the water table being such an important feature of the swamp, drain, they determined through that lawsuit, because of course they, had a, they, they collected a bunch of hydrological, geological data for the, the lawsuit, and they determined that if the water table drops even two or three feet, that's all it has to drop for the swamp to be dried up. That's about how much water is above ground. And so because a quarry, of course, the whole idea, right, is you pump all the water out of the a limestone and then, you, and then you harvest the limestone, it's really easy to, to prove that it would damage the swamp because that's such a clear connection. But right now we're facing, I would say, a bigger threat, a bigger, more complicated threat that is kind of harder for us to prove that it will um, damage the swamp irreparably. So essentially, um, a thousand home development has been proposed. It's the exact same property that the quarry developer tried to develop, and ever since 2005, it's just been not nothing's happened with it. So now this uh, Newcastle Homes has come in um, and proposed this thousand home development, 
It also has a commercial area as well. It's a huge, it's a 450 acre property. It's an enormous area, an enormous amount of homes. And um, the, the process of approving it has been a little bit frustrating for those, especially those of us in Mono Valley, right? Because we're not, as we're not voters in Alabaster, we don't necessarily have as big of a say. But they essentially approved the zoning change and the, um, the preliminary plans in 2020 on Zoom when nobody was going to council meetings and no one even realized it was happening. And so then it happened and then they were like, well, no one, no one said anything about it, but they were like, we didn't know it was happening because it was buried on an agenda. Um, and of course they didn't do any, I'm not saying Alabaster did anything illegal, but with such a big thing, they definitely did make an effort to make sure that people knew about it. Um, I've also heard though, for the record, there were some people who did show up to that meeting and voice their concern. It just wasn't, that many people. Um, but since then, there have been a lot of meetings. Has anyone else here? I know Rusty was at the meeting on Thursday. Has anybody else gone to any of these Alabaster meetings? There's been a variety of uh, either planning and zoning meetings or council meetings where various elements of this proposal have been up for debate. And the, there's lots of angry citizens in Alabaster. There's definitely a lot of energy against this. Um, but it is moving forward, it is all perfectly legal. There's not, it's not clear what the avenue is to stop it per se. Um, I also will say Newcastle has actually been really um, cooperative working with the university. They've met with us several times. We've also um, got a stormwater consultant that we have, they've allowed him to review the plans. And so there, it's not that they're uncooperative, um, it's just really the bigger question of can this ecosystem handle a thousand homes. Even if you do it correctly, could you ever do it in a way that didn't, didn't harm the swamp, right? Um, and really the biggest thing, like the, the number one concern is, it has to do with the groundwater recharge. So a lot of the citizens are really concerned about the flooding that might result from more impervious surfaces, more rooftops, more roads, things like that. Um, we're worried about that too, but we're not worried about the flooding as much as we're worried about the flooding water is water that's not going into the aquifer. And that is the thing that recharges the swamp. And most importantly, that mechanism is not protected by the Clean Water Act. So the Clean Water Act only has to do with, with flooding and with pollution, but it does not have to do with groundwater recharge. Now those things are related, like I said, because if you, if you get all of the flooding con under control, theoretically that means the water's going to um, percolate in the place it's supposed to go. But their basic plan is to put a bunch of retention ponds in, which we all know they sort of fail eventually, and we're not really sure if that's gonna be um, a real way to stop it. So I wanna show you just a little bit of a sense too. The other issue that we're facing is actually really not Newcastle's fault at all. It's a result of the general lack of strategic planning at an ecological level, right? Like even at a just city level that Alabaster doesn't seem super concerned about the idea of like strategically encouraging things here and there. But even if they did, the problem is that since 2005 when the quarry was proposed, the amount of development unrelated to this that has happened since then has also threatened the swamp's viability. So you can see Oh, we can, can we see the, can you zoom back out, Arthur? Is there not, yeah, I wanted to see this. So this is, so you can zoom back in. Um, this is that source water area that I showed you at the beginning. So this is basically all the ground that feeds into the recharging of the swamp. And, and again, credit to Mike Hardick, because he's the one who kind of compiled these together. Um, but you can see the red boundary is the overall watershed the principal watershed, so like the part that matters the most for the swamp is in yellow. And then the undeveloped portion is green hatched. So this is 2005 right here. And in 2005, the only thing that was developed in this whole area was just one corner, just up there, there was a housing development. That was it. If the rest of it was just totally, you know, not developed. If you fast forward to the next one, this is, do you want to zoom in again? This is 2022. So again, the green hatch is undeveloped. So now we've got this neighborhood, we got this neighborhood, we've got, or the school I think is this one, and then we've got this big old neighborhood, we got this neighborhood, this neighborhood, up there is still a thing. 
Um, Colonial Oaks or whatever is right here. It's kind of off there a little bit. But basically, yeah, right here. So now, even without the new development, it's already, I think, did it say 27% developed? So back then it was 5% developed, now it's 27%. And then if you go to the next slide, this would be, this is the overlay of the, the overlay of the proposed development that is the thousand home development. So you can see it, it's like half of the whole thing. I mean, it's an enormous amount of space, but on top of that, all these other ones is death from a thousand paper cuts. And this is where the swamp itself is. And it's just about gonna be the only not developed thing in the whole watershed. And so um, if this plan goes through and it gets developed in this way, Mike estimated that now our watershed is 44% developed um, from 5% in 2005. And so, yeah, it's a real open question as to whether the swamp can handle this. We have certainly, in the time that we've been listening to um, residents of Alabaster and primarily people who live along you know, Spring Creek and Shoal Creek, everyone's telling us the flooding has already gotten worse and that we're already concerned about the health of this ecosystem without this thousand home development. And so I don't know, I don't know if it's, like I said, I, I, I can't, I can't uh, be so pessimistic to assume this is the end of the swamp. I would like to think that there will be ways to stop it if it starts damaging the swamp, there'll be ways to intervene. There's also a chance the whole thing won't happen if the, if the market changes substantially. Y'all probably remember in 2008, there were a bunch of things that were supposed to be developed and then everything got abandoned. So I'm not hoping for that, but we just don't know. This project could take 10 to 20 to 30 years to complete. Um, but yeah, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Arthur. So what are we doing about it? This is a good question. Currently the status of the proposal of the, the project itself is they're still waiting for the, we're all still waiting for the US Army Corps of Engineers response to their Clean Water Act permit application. So they had applied about a year ago to fill in 27 acres of wetlands. And so the Corps has been reviewing that proposal they have reduced it in response to the, some of the core's feedback that they've already given. Um, and then the meeting that Rusty and I attended last Thursday was, um, was required as part of their process. Uh, they were supposed to hold a public meeting and make sure that the citizens had a chance to voice their concerns. And so, um, so we're still seeing what's going on with that. I, the, the university is also trying to put together a more formal response so that they can include it in that their response, right? So we'll respond to them, so they respond to us, and then that all goes to the core. Um, we've also started collecting water data more regularly. I know when Clay asked me to do this, you, you, you were curious, like, what long-term ecological monitoring data do we have? And the sad reality is we really don't have any long-term ecological or biological or hydrological data. Oh, you do? Okay, well, I don't think we can stand on the thing. Um, oh my gosh. So, um, so we are, we do have an environmental scientist on our faculty now who is collecting regular water data. Um, you want to see the people over the podium. Okay. So, so they, so we're hoping to continue to collect this regular water data. We're collecting both water quality and flow data so that if they do start con construction, that we will be able to, um, you know, make a direct uh, correlation between the damage and the activities. Um, and then we also, like I said, we've retained, the, the foundation has retained the services of a stormwater consultant who has been very helpful in help, helping to make sure that we ask the right questions and make sure that the developer has the right information, uh, you know, the right, the right ideas about stormwater. Um, so we will continue to work with the development, developer, and I don't have it on the slide, but there's also a lot of angry citizens out there, and so if anybody is angry and wants to get involved <laughs> there, so it was actually really kind of amazing at the meeting on Thursday, you know, people were getting madder and madder and madder, and at one point somebody stood up, this guy from Alabaster, and he was like, if I started to go fund me to buy a lawyer, who's with me? And everyone's like, yeah! <laughs> so they're, they're organizing in Alabaster, and I actually think Montevallo could get involved at that level, right? Because 
we're not, it, for those of us who are not citizens of Alabaster, it's hard to get the city to listen to us, but I think, um, especially for folks who live near the creek, you are certainly considered a stakeholder from a legal perspective. So if anybody here lives on the creek and wants to get involved, or does anyone here live in Alabaster? Hey, we need you guys, yes, please, yes, bug your representatives. Um, all I actually, representatives say your the ones in Alabaster are dollar signs. Yeah, they, 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 they don't do. care about the roads. They don't care about the schools. That oh, this this is really something they don't care about. But they don't care about that it's going to over overburden our schools. It's going to overburden the roads right in that area that are already busy, yeah. busy, busy. Well, they don't care. And that so that's the interesting. I would say like. I don't know if it was an oversight or a paradox or an annoyance, but the whole, my understanding is that the whole reason that Alabaster courted this development in the first place, and they courted it, Alabaster actively sought developers for this. This was not random. Um, and the reason they did that is, Arthur, can you go back to the map thing? Um, can you zoom into the thing here? The whole reason that the city wanted it, well, in addition to the house, they always see houses as money, which is funny because we don't collect enough in Alabama, we don't collect enough property taxes to pay for all these houses infrastructure. That's just like reality. But this road right here, this connector road thing with this little turn, this guy, that's like the whole reason that Alabaster wanted this development is because they saw that as a way to alleviate traffic on 119 and Smoky Road, which is ridiculous because it won't alleviate anything if you have a thousand extra homes. And all those people are coming out, 2,000 cars a day driving to work. It's not going to alleviate anything. Yeah. Um, is the Cahaba River Keeper involved in this? Yes. He is so active. He's so He's good. very aware of Shoal Creek and Mayhem Creek and yes. is very involved in things. There. Yes, he has been very involved. He was at the meeting on Thursday as well. He has been a great advocate. And, and he also could be someone who files suit ultimately because yeah. um, he's a lawyer and that's what they do. So yes, that's a great question. Yeah, so this is, uh, so I don't know if you want to, Clay, if you want to do your pictures first and then we do like open discussion or how would you like We're to? Open it up for discussion. Okay. Does any, uh, yeah, does anyone have any other questions or comments, ideas, anything? Yes, yes. Yeah, um, I think it's important to focus on the swamp, but the swamp is the foundation for this whole aquifer that comes mm -hmm. all the way down to you. Our water is dependent on this aquifer, and so is Calaveras. And I wonder why the three cities don't just get together and cooperate and figure out, you know, how much development can we have mm -hmm. and still have water? I think put in a yeah. thousand homes, and I said, well, where's that water going to come from? And a few, two or four years ago, mm -hmm. I was at a meeting, and the um, mayor of Chelsea was there and to speak. And he was really boosting Chelsea and Morgan through and this, got so much development off. And I raised my hand, I said, where's that water gonna come from? He said, oh, we get it from the county, Coos County. I said, not Coos County, whatever county. And, and I said, well, where do they get it from? He said, I don't know. Nobody knows. He said, I'll yeah. look into that. Well, yeah. this is important, people. There's hardly anything I can think of that's more important than assuring a permanent, sustainable, water supply and it's amazing the degree to which people overlook that they think well it's coming out of the faucet now no problem yeah that and water actually, comes out of the ground some residents who spoke at the meeting on thursday who live in some of these newer developments in that area said they already have water issues sometimes their pipes don't run and they don't have enough water to take a shower there so there's real that's a real threat that's not just like some abstract the yeah. time for planning is mm -hmm. long range planning, sustainability planning is now. It's really overdue. But the three yeah. cities, we're all really one big community. We got three political in entities, mm -hmm. but, but one major community yeah. environmentally. Yeah. Yeah, I think Doug, that's a great point. Thank you for the thing with Calera water and Montevallo water are also connected to this aquifer. So that is, yes, that's a big concern. For this for this project, um, other questions, comments. Well, doesn't yeah. the example of the Colorado River, where they begin to, to sue, and the state of Arizona has put a moratorium there, and no new house permits issued because there's no water for them, 
and the whole federal issue about water coming out of the Colorado, it's already ruining most of the Imperial Valley farmers where they've had to take water that they've been stealing for years. But Alabama seems to be reactive rather than proactive. Yeah, the Colorado River is a great cautionary tale for other places. I think you're right that Alabama doesn't see itself in that story because we have so much more rainfall that we're just confident that we'll have enough. And the Colorado River's big issue is that when they decided on the state's water allocation rights, it was in a time of unusually high water flow. And so that was, they, they've over allocated it for decades and decades now. Um, and they are to the point now where they might actually, you know, drain Lake Mead and not have any water for Las Vegas. And it's like, it's, it's, yeah. But another thing Alabama, so this is like a bigger question of Alabama too, is that we don't have a, a state level water management plan. And um, that's a big problem for when we have w like water shortages within the state, but also when we're trying to compete with nearby <coughs> states for water, we need to have better plans in place to say who gets what when, and we don't really have that either. And so that's something that the Alabama Rivers Alliance has as like a central goal of their work is to try to get a management plan in place so that we're not always just responding to emergencies. We might have like long-term goals in mind. Yeah, that's a great point. Other ideas, <coughs> questions? Well, what I, I like what you said about, I'm gonna let you, you talk for a second, um, that this is actually provided to us for free. You know, if nature's providing it for free and we can use it, provided we don't ruin it, and then have to start doing some really extreme, extremely expensive things. Yeah, and what Danielle Jennings, the one who's been doing the water testing, she did, whether or not you believe it really cleans the water, they've taken samples just north of the swamp and just south of the swamp, and it is much cleaner after it goes through the swamp. The water is in much better condition, absolutely. Rusty. First of all, it felt good being at a public hearing and not being inside the side of the table trying to yell at each I did get up and speak. Uh, my main concern is the density of this development that's above the swamp. Uh, looks to me like at least an R2, maybe an R4 type development, which here in Montevallo, we, most of the subdivisions that they're working on right now were already plotted uh, 10 years ago. And there's still a few R2 development, but this uh, P and Z board now on new plots of subdivisions, we're kind of leaning back towards R1 development, which is not as dense, uh, less houses, things like that. So that's kind of what I told the alabaster folks, you know, I'm, I'm concerned with taking in 40 something acres of, of wetland. Mm -hmm. I know at Colonial Oaks, I think we took in maybe one lot that was wetland there, two lots, and uh, they actually moved their green space to that area there where it wouldn't, you know, impact housing. So, you know, the, the alabaster council, they, they need to really work with the, uh, developer and, and uh, make sure they do things right. And I know they'll have plenty of retention ponds and all that, but if you don't maintain them, they fill in and then they're, they're worthless. And uh, you know, I just, I don't want the water to come to the swamp, overflow and then wind up in uh, an oil park with flooding. Cause uh, I can't tell you over the past 16 years, how many thousands and thousands of dollars we spent at oil park on, on flooding. And it's actually gotten a little better, but I mean, it's still a hard thunderstorm and, you know, we're replacing bridges and putting rock back in and, cause that, that is a signature park. And, uh, you know, we, we have to do what we can to protect it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, there's also another stakeholder that you're probably not aware of, but the University of West Alabama was gifted 300 some odd acres on the west side of the Cahaba River north of Centerville that they are developing. And they already got a fantastic interpretive center there just in the two years 
but if you were looking for supporters because they're the effect of the downstream effect of because Shoal Creek and Mayhem Creek that forms the Little Cahaba feeds the Big Cahaba South into Centerville, which is where their water comes from. And of course, West Alabama is doing so much now. Their center is all based on it being the frontage on the Cahaba River. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thanks for letting me and know you about that. think of them as being involved in this area, but they're definitely a stakeholder. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to switch gears a minute. Do you have any um, hands in maintaining, uh, upgrading, uh, whatever, College Lake? Uh, not directly, no. I'm sort of like in the loop on some stuff, but I, I'm not. Just, no. What is there a particular feature there that needs upgrading? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I hadn't even been out there in, in a while, but uh, I used to spend a uh, good bit of time out there and yeah. have fond memories of this place. Well, we certainly use it. We use it for our education program. We go out there a lot, and I take students out there. I definitely see it as you know one of our other environmental jewels. Um, and if anyone's gone out to see the new um, mountain biking trail that is being put in in the old golf course, that's also a really exciting rewilding thing where they're putting in these kind of rock trails for the course, but it is also, um, they're letting the grass become wild and go into primary succession and there's all these tall weeds now. It's really cool if you want to go look at it. Um, and I have had nothing to do with it, <laughs> but, um, but I'm supportive of the rewilding of that space. So um, that's exciting. I talked to Jeff about that a few months ago. Yeah. And I think she's, she's looking into it. Looking into it. There's a yeah. number of things that need to be done out there, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are great comments and questions. Any others? Come on. <laughs> okay, you stop it. Why? <laughs> All right. Why, Mama? Uh, well, if, if no one has any other comments, Doug's got one. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, this, I've already said this, but I want to reiterate. Uh, the three towns, you know, you've got three separate political entities. And so one, one entity does one thing, another one does another. Those, the three need to get together. There needs to be some kind of consortium or some sort of, <coughs> you know, organiza organization of the three towns to make some long range plans because all three are drawing on this aquifer. So what one does is going to affect the, the other. It's just, it's just, it's just I think that's a good, yeah. Rusty, we'll do, we'll do that, okay? Mama. We'll call up Alan Mama. out there. We'll call up. Mama. Okay. Um, yeah, and I know that the, I don't know what the mayor of Galera, like I have not met them. The mayor, the mayor of Alabaster has not made any friends in the process of this housing development. Um, they're, at the, at the very basic level, at the beginning, the Alabaster City Council was in no way listening to anyone. You know, everyone would go up and say things and then they would just, you know, sort of like glaze over and wait until it was done and then they would do whatever they were gonna do. And that was clearly not working. So they did, at least on the last meeting, have a moment where the mayor talked a little bit about some of the concerns people had. They didn't address them, but they were trying to make it at least seem like they heard them. I don't know. Well, you know, you've got a short range thing. Money is made when, when developers develop and, and maybe the city benefits from that. But boy, when you get into having to replace water, you, you, you get a tremendous yeah. expense. Yeah, and actually Dee Whittem put together a really, she's out of town right now. Does she come to this sometimes? Seems like the kind of thing she, she She's a member. She's a member. Yeah. So Dee put together a great list of um, the sort of economic cost of this kind of housing development. So she, you know, given her given her experience with city management and just her general economic expertise, put together like how you know you'd have to have this many more police officers, you'd have to have this many more like classrooms and teachers and buses and all these things, um, and then like the stormwater infrastructure. How many more you know like how many four gallons are going to go through a stormwater or a <coughs> wastewater treatment plant, that kind of stuff. And the amount of money that it costs, they yeah, have the tax, and then she also like put together an estimate for how much tax 
dollars this would all generate, and it was not, it does not come out in favor of this making money at all. I don't actually know, maybe Rusty, where do they even get the money then? It's all from sales tax? Is that like, I don't, under, no, I don't even need. know, or is it like a Ponzi scheme where you have to keep developing because all of the new houses have to pay for the whole failing infrastructure? With the development, as far as housing, residential, I mean, it, it costs you money. It's just what you said, you, you've got to provide police protection, fire and rescue, uh, garbage, uh, sewer and water. Uh, the only money that the city actually gets is you hope that the residents shop your city, mm -hmm. which we run into all the development north of the crossroads or from the American Village North. Most of those citizens shop Alabaster and Calera. So, you know, those, and, and those are large subdivisions. You yeah. know, and we're trying to recruit them you know, back into town. And, uh, you know, that's that's our goal, but it, residential road costs you money in the long run. I want to just say one other thing. Yeah. You know, I <clears throat> could see uh, this area becoming a great parkland because, and that would keep it natural. I don't know how many of you all go to Oak Mountain State Park, but it has become almost like a city park. There, there's so much dense population that uses that area now. And it's a wonderful 10,000, a little bit over 10,000 acre park. But to have a, a park land in this region would be a great boon for the whole region. Yes, but it's going to cost vast amounts of money. Yeah, but Oak Mountain got there because somebody gave it to me. Well, they, the, the original land, the original yes. 10,000 acres? Yes. And then this goes with Dave's addition. Well, don't you have a rich uncle? I'll be shut You're talking about the expansion. You're talking about the expansion of Oak Mountain Station. I just went to I just went to a Forever Wild meeting where they like shut down a new expansion there at the end of their expansion rope. Did, did anyone else hear about that? There was another track that was nominated and some of the board wanted to make it even bigger and then another part of the board said it's already the biggest land holding that we have. Let's not put money into it anymore. That might be the end of that. Yeah. I saw a couple hands. Did you have your hand up? Or you? Yeah. I just wanted to say that I agree completely with Doug because uh, one of the best things that we could do is to make our area even more unique than it already is. And one way to do that is to limit the type of development they're talking about as roads. And that's what a lot of people have been saying that you've been talking around about in this lecture too. We don't stop long enough to think about the absolute jewel that we have right here already. And we need to just develop that more. Not Yeah, well, and you just reminded me too, I think the thing, I, we can't fix this with this housing development, but it is very sad to me as I am a, a biking and walking commuter around Montevallo and living in Montevallo, that's very easy to do. But Alabaster is so spread out that if you wanted to walk or bike somewhere, even if you had a bike and you weren't as scared of the traffic, it's just all the distances are so great. And I really wish that there would be more attention paid to how could we actually do development that would allow people to kind of exist fully within that space and be able to walk and bike and not have to get in their car. Because yeah, everyone in that group is thinking a thousand more houses shopping at the Publix on 119. And it's like, well, it'd be cool if there was a little grocery store you could just walk to or something. There's just not enough, there's not enough whole life development. It's all just like houses, 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 and we'll worry about the commercial on a separate day. And thinking about it together would be really cool. Yeah. My husband and I just got back from Yellowstone and they were not able to make that protected until FDR got involved. Mm -hmm. It had to be somebody, you know, no, nobody had enough money. It had to be the federal government. So could our federal government or our state government or get involved? That would be really cool. Yeah, well, so, so, yeah. Yeah. Wildlife preserve. Who's got two minds? Well, the, the three cities, the three towns began to ask our state government to do this. It could, it could happen. It could happen. That's yeah. a lot of citizens. 
I mean, I certainly, I certainly don't know enough about the mechanisms, but I do think that you're right, and I, I think that you know, when you look at examples of historical efforts, um, yeah, citizen, citizen organization can really get stuff done. Absolutely. Um, so I, I was, I was, I think I was telling Martha on the way in. At the university and the university foundation are kind of, we're protecting the swamp and we're doing what we can, but we're also somewhat unable to you know organize and go radical because we also need to maintain a good relationship with alabaster um and of course yeah the university doesn't want to burn any bridges well you gotta go again if you're gonna do this hey 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 you gotta go you gotta go yeah you do i don't think anybody thinks this is particular deep. um so so um oh wait what was i just talking about I know, I know, I, yeah, I totally, I totally lost my train of thought, thanks to your shenanigans, Ramona. Um, who were talking about? Organizing people. Oh yeah, the university is not able to like take a, like a, a radical stance against all this stuff, um, but we are totally supportive of all citizens who want to get involved. We're just sort of not in the position to be the like leaders of the revolution. Um, Sounds like the people in Alabaster might be organizing themselves. There's also a really great listserv if you are interested in just keeping informed about all this. Um, a woman named Jessica Snow has has been really detail-oriented, compiling all sorts of good. Are you on her listserv? Yeah, all sorts of good information she about. She sends out emails mm -hmm. like yeah. crazy and, and gives you all the yes. dirt. So that's actually another place I would start if you want to just stay involved, maybe think about ways that citizens could try to get federal support. You know, I think um, it's a special place to us, but it's up to us to convince somebody else that it's worth more than just being in our backyard, right? I think that's, that's the biggest challenge. Um, I know David Butler, the Cobb Riverkeeper, he used told me that one of the hardest parts of his job is the number, the sheer number of complaints that they receive on the river, and people really want the Cahaba Riverkeeper to come in and sue those guys and like get them and like fix it, and they probably get ten times the number of requests that they can actually honor. They don't have enough resources to to do it all. There's so many threats to the Cahaba, they kind of have to pick and choose, and so they say no a lot of the time to people. The fact that they've been so involved with this tells me how important it is to the overall health of the Cahaba. Um, but, you know, that's, yeah, they also can't do it alone. They, I think the things that they get involved with are largely the things that there's help for. They can't do things by themselves very easily. Um, so. Well, if we were to uh, three towns together and were to try to save that area as a parkland, and that would give you something to be for instead of just yes. always being against. Well, actually the group, so I don't know if this is any way possible, but the group uh, that was there on Thursday, a lot of people were really interested in what the land had been sold for and whether or not they could buy the land. I think it sold for like $7 million or something. So it's, I don't know who was gonna raise $7 million, but it would probably be more than that now. Um, you guys got that? It would really much state and yes. maybe federal involvement. Well, we talked to them about um, nominating it for Forever Wild, um, but the problem with that is that um, right now they'll, they just make more money with houses, so they're not ready to consider that option. But at least they know what's on the table. If the market tanks, they know that Forever Wild could give them some money. So that's that's another one of my hopeful outcomes: is that they won't they'll find that the houses don't make enough profit, and then they'll just sell the rest to Forever Wild. That'd be cool. I don't know if we're out of time. No. If that keep going, if anybody wants to. Does anybody have any? Ask me anything else? Because <clears throat> I know we have some more some more photos, right, to share. Right. Well, what I've got is <clears throat> something to make you feel a little, a little better about <laughs> what, what we're starting. This is going to be the aesthetic side, the pleasurable pleasurable side of visiting the swamp and to also show you uh, what's downstream. So Arthur, if you would go to the next one. <clears throat> this is photography from a visit that my wife Tony and I made to the swamp a few years ago uh, with a couple of old friends of our, ours who were University of Montreal alumni. 
Uh, one is an old friend who's visiting here from Oregon. The other uh, is a local, well, the friend from Oregon, his name is Gary Fuller. And uh, the other fellow with us was a uh, Birmingham boy named Keith Harrelson, who some of you may know. <clears throat> so we decided uh, on one day while Gary was here, and this was in the month of May, to go to the swamp. And so, in addition to that, we were able to also go to the Cahaba Lily <coughs> viewing down just, just south of uh, Wilton here. So I'm just gonna show you <coughs> the, the photos that we shot that day, just to give you a sense of how truly beautiful the swamp is and what the additional beauty that it feeds and supports downstream. So just change it like every 10 seconds or so. Okay. <laughs> so this is our group at the, at the swamp. It gives you a good sense of what you can see from the boardwalk. I have music with this. <laughs> This is sort of toward the end of the boardwalk here, just below the house. Oops, it's distorted. I can say from personal experience, going through here on the boardwalk feels much safer than waiting for all this. <laughs> it truly is a very sneaky place. So this is the same day. <coughs> this is the just below the, the Piper Bridge, you can see the lilies were going just great out there. And either side of this is the uh, wildlife reserve right. that Bibb County got together and got fish and wildlife and got donations for them to buy the reserve. But I think it's fair to say that if anything profound happens to the swamp, who knows what the effect would be yeah. down here. Yeah. I think that's maybe the hardest thing is that when you actually look at the property in question, it does not, it's not really very spectacular. You know, it really just, it's ecological function is the most important thing. Um, so, I mean, I want to see it preserved, but, and I, I think if we could, if we could have it as like, it'd be a great place to have hiking trails and stuff. It's just not, it's, it's not necessarily as, doesn't have any cobble lilies. But, yeah. It's as valuable it is. to the community as the kidneys are to a body. Yes. It's yeah. A filter. Yeah, and I actually, I will say one of the things that the um, what one of the things that the developer was trying to assure people is they were showing us pictures of the you know wetlands and they're not really that fancy looking and the people at the meeting really took issue with that. They're like. You know, just because it's an ephemeral stream and it doesn't flow all the time doesn't mean it's not important. Like you're making it sound like just because there's not water in that creek bed all the time, that means it's not an important creek bed. And it still is. So, yeah. Anyway. Well, if any, I know that this is probably at the end of our time, or if not, we can, I mean, we'll continue to hang out and eat snacks. And if anybody wants to talk more about any other, any of these issues, I'm happy to continue the conversation. Um, and thank you so much.